everyone. This is a great conversation I had with Austin Griffith from Burner Wallet and Arjun Botani of Connext Network from Ethereal 2019. We discussed a topic that's been on lots of people's minds. After a hugely speculative period in crypto, how do we get usage? I cover the ins and outs with two down-in-the-trenches builders about what they're doing to get everyday adoption. If you're not yet signed up for my weekly newsletter, go now to unchainedpodcast.com to find out what I think are the top crypto stories of the week. Also, if you're interested in spending a weekend discussing crypto, but also doing yoga, enjoying the outdoors, and eating healthy food, check out the show notes for the link to a crypto workshop I'm teaching at Omega Institute in September. And now, here's my conversation with Austin Griffith and Arjun Bhuptani. Cypher Trace makes it easy for exchanges and crypto businesses to comply with cryptocurrency anti-money laundering laws, avoid illegal sources of funds, and maintain healthy banking relationships. CypherTrace is helping you grow the crypto economy by keeping it safe and secure. Welcome to our panel, DeFi and, and, passive, and paths to everyday usage. I am happy to welcome you all here. And I've got Arjun and Austin here as well. Um, so why don't we uh, kind of set the stage for why we're talking about this particular topic. Um, I think most of you know that Pretty much so far, what crypto has been used for is pretty much speculation and not much else other than like maybe a little bit of actual payment activity and dark market activity. And I think after the 2017 bubble, we got to this period where um, the prices started to crash and people were like, oh, nobody's using this stuff. And I think a lot of people now are interested in how we can actually get people to use cryptocurrencies and crypto assets and this technology. And so we've got a couple of people here that are working um, in different ways on that issue. And we're going to discuss how they're doing it and also how they think about getting adoption. So um, why don't we start with you, Austin? Um, people might already be familiar with what you're working on because they're using it here. Uh, so why don't you tell us about Burner Wallet? Yeah, so I'm Austin Griffith. I'm the director of research at Gitcoin. Uh, I built the Burner Wallet leading up to ETH Denver to do the same thing we're doing here where you get uh, a little token or a card that has a private key on it. You're able to use that, uh, you scan that, and you get a wallet, instant wallet, right? No wallet download, no seed phrase, none of that. You go directly to having a wallet with funds in it. You go up to the food truck, scan a QR code, buy food. We also put a prediction market in it this year, so you can open up your wallet that you got your card with and uh, participate in a prediction market by just tapping your thumb. No, no downloads, no seed phrases. And can I ask you to not hold this part of the mic? Uh, can like, you hold it down here? Like, oh... Thank you. How's that? I, I don't know if that will affect the sound, but just okay. in case, I, I just wanted to make sure. Okay, and so Arjun, why don't you talk about Connext Network? Sure. Um, so I'm Arjun, I, one of the founders of Connext. Um, Connext is building a state channel network, which is a scalability solution on top of Ethereum. Uh, the goal is at, at some point when a lot of users start using Ethereum, this is going to become a very pressing problem. And we sort of experienced that back in 2017. Um, and that was when we realized that if, if we're ever going to get to any sort of mainstream usage, we need to have some way to scale transactions to the point where you have feature parity with existing solutions like uh, like payment networks and things like that. Yeah, so scaling is definitely a big issue. And Austin, I know that you had kind of like a different um, entry point to how you came to work on Burner Wallet. Like, what was the inspiration for that? So, yeah, I started by building games, and I built, like, these things that I really loved, and they were a lot of fun for me, but I could not get anybody to come play the games. It was, it, the onboarding was having E, downloading MetaMask, understanding, you know, a lot of the concepts within the space. So I kind of transitioned to meta transactions and figuring out how to abstract some of that away, abstract away gas costs and ETH, and then that kind of led to the burner wallet where... Uh, yeah, so now it's kind of coming full circle, and now I'm trying to build games on top of the burner wallet. So it, it's a weird... It's, I feel like I got in in winter, and I've been just kind of quietly building in winter. And, and so I quiet. think also um, there was a discussion that you had with somebody about problems in Venezuela and how people there might take advantage of this technology. Can you talk a little bit about that yep. as well? Yeah, so... Uh, my buddy Alejandro is working on, I think it's the Open Money Initiative. I think that's what it is, yeah. And they're trying to figure out how to make crypto. And it, it's sort of the, the intersection of needing decentralization and uh, 
also having really good UX and mass adoption. But to get mass adoption, you find like that intersection. And so he, he was trying to figure out how to get crypto into uh, Venezuela and actually build a wallet that's just really, really easy to use. And when we were talking, I said, well, let's, let's put it into a web browser. And he wanted to go the, the app route. And so we kind of are working in parallel on, on a very similar thing where he'll, he'll have a, a wallet that will work on Android 4.1. And I'm trying to get it like, just like working in a browser on anything uh, the same way. Yeah. And, and so, why did you, why was the browser important The, the browser you? would be like, if you have this old, old phone. Like if you have an old phone from 2014, it still has a web browser on it. So it's, it's, it's kind of more of a guarantee that those features will still work uh, uh, there, there in Venezuela. Yeah, because you're thinking about that particular audience, that they may not have like the latest technology. Exactly. Yep. And then um, actually just to kind of keep going with you know, what happened, I know that you introduced, um, or I don't know if you introduced, but like definitely one of the places where a lot of people first started talking about what you're working on was at East Denver. So can you talk about kind of what you did there and what happened? Yep. So we, um, we did the same thing we did here where we handed out, but we did solid coins. They scanned the coin. They had a wallet. They were able to buy food. Uh, I think the numbers were like 4,400 meals were purchased at the food trucks. Uh, we off-ramped about 38k in dye to the food trucks, so they they basically earned their money, and it was all in crypto. And uh, the the fun part was it was about 20 cents in transactions, which is a, a little bit better than probably a lot of other uh, payment networks. Very cool. And Arjun, you've been working on the dye card. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah. So. Uh, it, the die card works really similarly to the burner. Actually, we were inspired by the burner wallet and uh, and then the spank card. Uh, it's kind of an amalgamation of both of those ideas. But what we wanted to do was show that you can get the same uh, quality of user experience uh, through scalability solutions that are available today, which are still on the native Ethereum chain. Um, we mostly wanted to kind of inspire people to go and build more things using that afterwards, which uh, generally, like we found, has been really, really effective. And uh, so how does that work on the back end? Because you talked about scaling. And so obviously we know like the, the regular Ethereum chain is kind of hard to scale. So how are you making that happen? Yeah, so the, the, I guess the primary difference between the burner and, and the die card is, uh, or at least like xdai.io and the die card, is that uh, xdai.io runs on the xdai sidechain, um, which because it's a sidechain, because like there's less people on it, and because of the way that it operates, uh, has much lower fees and transaction times. Um, uh, on Ethereum, to achieve that kind of scalability, you need to use uh, state channels, or payment channels at least. Um, and so what we do is we, we uh, build, allow people to, when they deposit into the die card in the same way as when you deposit into, uh, into xdai.io, um, you, you're depositing into a payment channel which uh, allows you to batch up your transactions. Um, so, you know, the number of on-chain transactions that you're doing is dramatically reduced, but you still have the same sort of, uh, uh, you know, trust minimization, security outcomes, and uh, uh, effectively looks exactly like Venmo. Yeah. And I know that sort of similar to how Austin made this choice to try the web browser in the beginning just to, you know, have more adoption... You also kind of made a choice where you're starting off in a slightly more centralized way. So can you talk about how that is and then why you went that route? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we sort of... So that a lot of the difficulty of building like scalability solutions, I mean, even, even in general Ethereum infrastructure, is that uh, you have this like pipeline of data that you're collecting. And... Um, it's data that's collected over this life cycle uh, that goes from like research, engineering, and then to actually real users using it. Um, and unfortunately, that like that data pipeline in most development situations ends up being this incredibly long three-year process where you do a bunch of research, um, develop formalized specifications, and then put that you know en engineer it and then put that in front of users. Um, we sort of realized that that wasn't going to be fast enough for us to actually collect the data that we needed in order to. Um, build the right kind of solution, especially since so much of the research ends up being informed by what happens at the engineering and user feedback stages. Um, and so we, we ended up deciding to build iteratively where we said, okay, let's build a, a microcosm of the network where you have just one node um, and you start building apps on top of it and we have users interact with those apps so that we can figure out what things actually matter. Um, and as it turned out, a lot of the things that we thought mattered really didn't. 
Um, it turned out that you know, like a lot of really, really basic things that that most people over overlooked, just things like you know integrations, things like how you know where would you even integrate with Connect? Those those were the sorts of questions that we needed to be answering rather than optimizing on a couple of the smaller research bits. Yeah, so let's talk about that sort of pragmatic aspect. Um, both of you guys are using Dai as well, the stable coin. Um, you know, why are you guys using that, and why did you choose that out of all the stable coins? Low cognitive overhead, right? Like when when I send my mom five tokens, <clears throat> she needs to know that that's just five dollars. If I send her point zero zero three, that's just harder for her to understand. So it, it, for me, you've got the fast side chain or a fast state channel. You've got low transaction fees, and then on top of all of that, then you've got low cognitive overhead because she doesn't have to know what the you know what the conversion rate is or anything like that. If I give her five, she's got five dollars. It's easy to understand. Um, yeah, exactly the same thing. It was just uh, uh, two things. One is that where most of the early testing was done with my mom's friends. Um, the mom and, uh, it, really? it really works. Yeah, exactly. It was just a bunch of people who knew nothing about crypto. Um, I, we got to the point where uh, we got to this unanswerable question, which was, uh, all right, now I have this money in my wallet. I, I know how to use it. I know how to send it to my friends. What can I do with it? Where can I spend it? And so that's, that's kind of the problem that we're working on now. But, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it's having that all happen in dollars is just makes so much sense to people even within the industry we've realized uh where you know you you want to hold eth and as an investment but then when you're doing day-to-day -day payments you you sort of want to have it in something that you can understand um and and rather than doing the like mental conversion to dollars before you buy something with this uh this just so, sort of solves that problem and but i so i am curious about the choice of dying in particular as a stable coin because as we've seen it's actually not uh, stable to the dollar, um, and there are other stable coins that are built on Ethereum. So, why why Dai? Um, so, partly ubiquity. Uh, Dai has the, the biggest network effects right now, um, and there's a lot of like traction happening with the Maker ecosystem, which means, and it, it's all sort of like. Build, like buying into these network effects, right? Because if if more uh, like applications on Ethereum start accepting Dai as a means of payment, then that means that more and more people can use the burner or the Dai card to pay for them. And uh, and then uh, the other part of it is just that it's like part of the way that Maker works is that liquidity is sort of guaranteed. Um, so you like it's true that the price is fluctuating, and uh, right now, at least recently, that was because there was not enough demand for using Dai. Um, but at some point in the future, when there is demand for using DAI, there's this enormous incentive for people to start creating more and more CDPs. And so I think in the instance where demand for DAI skyrockets, um, even, even if it is sort of a stepwise function, you, you're not going to have a situation where people are suddenly like, okay, I want to use DAI to pay for things, but I can't get access to it. Did you know that if money laundering were an economy, its GDP would be the size of Canada's? Large volumes of tainted crypto assets move through financial networks, often below the radar of banks. Cybercriminals use unregulated crypto exchanges to avoid detection. No wonder governments around the world are rolling out tough, new anti-money laundering laws for cryptocurrencies. Complying with those laws isn't easy. Banks and exchanges need the best cryptocurrency intelligence available to avoid penalties. Now you can use the same powerful AML and compliance monitoring tools used by regulators. CypherTrace is securing the crypto economy. To learn more, visit cyphertrace.com slash unchained. So if people are trying to build uh, these products that actually get used, and you know, you're talking about um, how you're using DAI because you, you know, know that people want to tra transact in dollars and stuff, at the same time, we have these uh, other companies that are also working in this space, and they're much bigger. So how do you think about that? How do you think about trying to develop something that will gain adoption? And meanwhile, Facebook is working on something where they could easily roll it out to their more than 2 billion monthly active users, and that would be adopted right away. So how, how do you think about, you know how to build and then how to kind of uh, get activity. They'll, they'll still have to deal with the same issues we do, right? Like if they, if they run the chain the same way ours or Ethereum or our side chains run, 
they still have to worry about block times, they still have to worry about key pairs, if they do it that way. And uh, so I don't know a ton about it yet, but they'll, they'll have to go through the same research that we go through is, you know, how do, how do we present a seed phrase? Do we present a seed phrase? How do we present gas? How do we talk about it? So to, to me, I just see that they'll, they'll have to, if they go our same route, they'll have to learn all these things like we, like we are. Right. Um, there's also something that I think not a lot of people consider um, about, like, having some large centralized entity talk, like, create a currency that everybody uses. Um, we, like, this already sort of happens where the U.S. government creates the dollar, right? And, uh, and there is still resistance to using the dollar for everything outside of the U.S., um, even though there, like, the do- there's dollar ubiquity in, in most countries. And I think that that would only be exacerbated by the fact that there's, you know, one single company creating face coin or whatever it is um, and uh, and then trying to get that used with a bunch of for a bunch of other use cases so I think people could use it internally for payments uh, people might even be able to use it for like merchant to merchant payments but every single jurisdiction that they go to they're gonna have to have the same conversation where they say okay how are you gonna regulate Facebook as an organization how are you gonna regulate all the people that are you know validating in this ecosystem and like buying into uh, into face coin and uh, and I think that that it's it sort of comes back to the, the core idea of a lot of this stuff, which is social scalability. Um, at, at some point, if, if I'm hoping that at some point the light bulb goes off in regulators' minds where they say, okay, wait, uh, Ethereum and projects built on top of Ethereum that are decentralized will work the same way everywhere. Um, Facebook and their cryptocurrency and projects that build on top of that may not. And that's, that's a big difference. So, but, so how do you guys think about which... Um, partnerships you want to make or which communities you want to target when you know that there is this company out there that could just roll something out to such a big community like are you like you know you I know you have some partnerships with like Ujo and I think Spank Chain too as well yeah and obviously you're you know you're kind of doing these test cases like at the guess at these conferences but is your end goal to somehow introduce in Venezuela or like because the other the other it's not even actually just I don't want to make it sound like it's only Facebook coin but like um, in general, especially in the U.S., where you are trying to compete in this environment where people have PayPal and Venmo and um, credit cards, and so just in general, how do you think about getting adoption with your small uh, or small at the moment projects? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I I still think that they have to tackle the same issues we do. Like, are they going to hit the user with a wallet download? Are they going to hit all two hundred? You know, if if they hit all those users with the same thing they're going to see the same drop off that we see. So I think that uh, adoption still works the same way. Like you still like that's why we have the burner is because you could just pull up a website and use it and it works quickly, right? It's it's not something you want to have a bunch of money in, it's something that you use to transition you to something else. And I think the burner is like a lowercase b burner, not an uppercase. I don't think it's a product itself, it's more of a an idea or a mechanism to drive onboarding. And I think I will bet Facebook has something similar with their coin if that's how it works. Like they'll use something similar to move it around because they'll find that if they try to get their user to have to download something and they hit them with a seed phrase up front, they're gonna lose users. Um yeah, I guess, like, so, so I'll, I will say that um, from, from the conversations that we've had outside of the space with, uh, with like, end users who have nothing to do with crypto, um, we really, really have our odds, like, stacked against us. Uh, the existing payment system and, like, existing payment networks are very, very, very entrenched. Um, I, I think that's also going to be true for Facebook uh, and for any other company that, like, st- like, creates a currency and wants to scale it globally. Um, but I think one thing that I, a lot of people miss is that it's like, it's not just a, about you know uh, whether or not you're using this technology. It's also about like all the things that get built along with it. Um, like there's there's historically uh, open systems have just always succeeded in, on a long enough time scale because uh, open systems just allow for this uh, exponentially compounding innovation to happen on top of them, and uh, and like. It may actually be the case that something like Facebook or some other, you know, currency comes along and wins the market. But I, I'm very, very bullish that in the long term, uh, an open means some, some like some open platform will win. So in the interim, though, I do think in the short term there will be kind of an advantage that more centralized services have. So how do you think about just competing over the long term? I mean, like. It just does feel a little bit like 
Okay. I mean, because honestly, both of your answers were, like, your answer especially was a little bit more technical, but I'm asking really just about how do you get the users? Like, yeah, okay, you can build the thing and maybe it can scale or maybe it, you know, has the right block times or whatever, but then how do you get people to actually use it? Like, are you thinking about that or is it more just about making sure the technology works or... It, it seems like there's like a spectrum of decentralization, right? It, it, like, I don't think you want to hit pers- hit someone with like full decentralization up front. I think you kind of ease them into it. So, so I think that in terms of getting users, it's okay to have a little bit of central, like your node, it's centralized right now, but it won't be eventually. And like, it, it's okay to have a little bit of, you know, I don't want to say against our ethos, but you, a little softer version of what we have. And that's how we bring in users and we get them involved and we... Once they once they kind of uh, see the value and and kind of create a narrative behind their account, then they're much more likely to take those next steps to to get into the system more. So, if I'm understanding correctly, basically what you're asking is, how can we get users when coming up against some some large organization that already has a very large footprint of users that um, has a like history of of retaining those users for a very long period of time? Yeah. Um, so. Small startups beat large companies all the time. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, they beat them badly enough that the startup gets acquired for a lot of money, and a lot of the time, they just beat them outright, and then the startup exists, and the, the large company dies. Um, uh, the reason is that startups have a much closer relationship with their users than large companies ever can, um, because you, as a founder, literally have to be in front of a user and doing customer support all the time. Um, and that means that you get a very in-depth understanding of what your users actually need and what their problems are. Um, I think kind of what Austin was trying to say is that like we're all like even even Facebook is going to come at this from the same from the same level of understanding as we are right they they know their users very well but they don't fully understand how their users will react to this stuff and so they're going to start collecting data in the same way that we can um, I I while they have a larger data set to draw from um, the the level of intensity with which like we need to operate because it's, for us it's like a key survival thing um, is is has to be way higher and and like that historically uh, is the reason why startups have won and so at this moment are you just pretty much focused on the tech because I do also want to ask like so when it comes to on the ground like actually just getting people to use it do you have any plans for that yet because I do remember um, during the ICO craze, a lot of people were saying that there was this like light bulb moment where a bunch of teams realized like, oh, the community manager is super, super important. Um, but I feel like that's kind of the same concept here. If you're actually trying to get real adoption, like you need somebody who, um, you know, is kind of like a non-technical person who can talk to everyday people who don't know anything. But yeah. So how are you, are you guys thinking about that at all yet? Or is it kind of off in the future? Um. So we, we, and I think Austin does this as well, we, we have constantly been talking to people both with inside and outside of the space. And it's like, uh, we, we, I like, I personally end up talking to at least like three to four people a day that, that use our stuff and, and that I get feedback from that are not necessarily, that aren't even like users yet. Um, and a lot of the time it's people who don't want to use our stuff. Um, and we specifically go after those people to figure out what it is that's broken about our stuff um, so that we can make it better. Um, similarly, we, we went, like, we, for the last six weeks, what we've been doing uh, is actually not as much dev, more just user research outside the space. So we went and um, talked to tons and tons of people within uh, the indie gaming industry and, like, indie content in general, just to understand more about how those, how those uh, like, ecosystems worked. And we found a lot of really fascinating things. Like, for instance, um, you know, there's this really big misconception in our space that a big part of the reason why people will, will adopt this is that uh, the you know the cost of doing transactions through crypto is lower, and it turns out that just doesn't matter to, to people, um, right? Like in in indie gaming, people happily pay thirty percent fees to platforms, um, and and even though they have PayPal as an option, which takes three percent fees, and the reason that they do that is because you get so much other stuff with platforms like DRM management, like an existing community to reach out to, things like that, which you wouldn't get at all with like a direct sales model. Um, so it's that kind of stuff that, like, I think more people need to do. Uh, just get out of the building, go talk to people, uh, put 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 you know the die card, the burner, whatever it is that you're building in front of them, and say, hey, like, try using this, and then prepare to have your ego shattered a little bit. <laughs> For sure, yeah. That's that's the same thing we did, like, leading up to ETH Denver. 
we, we would just go to bars in northern Colorado and just drop paper wallets on people and just, like, watch their eyes and watch where their thumbs went. And, like, one of our buttons, our main button, was, like, too far away for the thumb. So I just, I would, oh, we got to iterate on that. We got to get that in a different place. And it's just, like, week after week, we would, we would go to the bars, we would drop the paper wallets, uh, we would pay, right? Like, I, I would pay a $200 bar tab at the end of the night, but I'd also have a notebook of all these scribblings of all the things that we needed to fix for the next week. And we would do that over and over again until Eat Denver or some of these other events. And it, it runs a lot smoother when you do that. And it's, it's all about, like, compounding. I sort of mentioned this earlier, but it's all about, like, the rate at which you're getting data, right? Like, it, it, we, don't, we don't know what product it is that we need to build yet. Um, if we knew what product it is that we needed to build, what we could just do is raise, you know, uh, $50 million, hire like a huge team of the world's best developers and just tell them, okay, go build this. And then it's just a matter, it's like a deterministic process where we can say, okay, in three months we will know exactly, we will have this product and we can sell it to this exact market. But like what we need to do is collect data to understand what product to build and what, what the market really wants and what the market even is. Um, and so that's, that's like, it's just collecting that data faster, faster and faster and faster um, so that you can compound your own learning. Okay, so we're like almost out of time, but just really, really quick last question. How does the uncertain regulatory atmosphere here in the U.S. affect like how you guys are developing also? Because I just want to know, like, if you're going to get adoption, you need to, I guess, have some security. You're not going to go to jail. So how are you guys thinking about that? That's the, my, my product's called the burner wallet. So I think you got to answer that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, so... So uh, I think uh, a lot of people might have heard about this, but uh, a few days ago, like FinCEN released uh, like some new opinions on, on money transmission law for this industry, and like that had a lot of really interesting um, consequences for the way that people are thinking about like DeFi and about building DApps. Um, now, it, it it isn't clear from that uh, to to most lawyers that like there's anything specifically wrong with like scalability solutions or anything like that but that's that's the exact sort of thing where we we have to be really careful because we need to understand what consequences does this have how does this affect our users do we now need to target a different subset of users because you know uh are we targeting users that like uh would if in the united states would now have to be regulated and they can't afford to be regulated so um i think not having certainty or not having like I'd, I'd rather have an answer, uh, like a bad answer, than no answer. And uh, and so not having certainty just slows down that the rate at which we can collect data because all of a sudden we could spend months and months trying to talk to a certain group of users and find that, hey, we can't even serve those users. Yeah, yeah. And Hester Hurst, the SEC commissioner, did come out with a speech a few days ago where she kind of said the same thing, actually. So that's kind of good for you. Um, so on that positive note, we will end it here. Thank you guys so much. And um, yeah, I guess we'll see you around. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you.